As every week, I will ask people to uh, open their cameras. Uh, despite bad hair days, uh, strange backgrounds, uh, this really helps the speaker to feel that we're uh, with them. It's very good also to see people. Okay, I find this uh, in itself very satisfying. Hey, Daniel. So, uh, I say this often, but this week it's a special pleasure for me okay, uh, to have Yaraya Shirun from Tel Aviv University, uh, who I'm going to put as a co-host now, one second, okay, to join us and discuss her work. Yara and me, we go way, way back. I, I tried to remember actually when I started, but it seems like we, she was always there somehow in my academic career because we've uh, both done the MRI work. And then Yara did her PhD with Noam Sobel and Yadin at the Wiseman Institute. And then she went on to a postdoc with Uri Hassan at Princeton. And she's been working on how to interpret naturalistic stimuli and how this works between different people. Very, very interesting stuff. We'd had a first opportunity to actually work together this year. So we have an ongoing collaboration. That's a lot of fun. And I'm very excited to hear what's been going on the past few years. Okay, so Yara, stage is yours. Thank you, thank, you thank you, I'm very happy to virtually be here, although fashion will be late, but still here. And um, yeah, our collaboration, Roy just reminded me that I was there when Roy got, like he started smiling on a Zoom meeting and then <laughs> he realized that he got, he received the ERC. So it was really exciting seeing that live, um, yeah. Okay, so now I will share um, share my screen. Um, just a second. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep, I'm good. Cool. Okay, great. Um, so during the talk, please feel free to ask questions. Not, you don't have to wait till the end. It's funner when it's more interactive. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk today about brain mechanisms underlying shared or unshared understanding. And I would like to start with a quote that I like, that it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And even in this simple picture, while we all agree that we're looking at some kind of a debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, some of us will not actually see the same thing. And this is the case because we perceive the world through our own subjective filters, through our emotions, through our beliefs, through our prior knowledge. And in our lab, we're interested in asking on which level do these filters operate? So for example, when a right um, wing and a left wing person are looking at this same uh, political debate, where does the response diverge? Is it already in the retina that the input differs? They're just not looking at the same input. Is it in early sensory regions, in higher order region? Is there a gradient in the divergence of the response such that there is a small difference in early sensory regions and this difference is amplified in higher order regions? So today, what I want to tell you is about three projects aiming to test this question using fMRI. In the first project, we presented participants with stories that are composed of similar words, but they actually generate two different narratives. In the second project, we manipulated participants to interpret the same situation in different ways. And in the third ongoing project, we use participants' natural tendencies to uh, interpret the world through their own subjective filters. Now, the first two projects were done uh, during my postdoc in collaboration with Uli Hassan in Princeton University. And the third uh, ongoing project is uh, done in my relatively new lab, two years old, um, here in Tel Aviv University. Okay, so let's start with the first project. So a small change in the word we use can generate a big difference in the narrative. So for example, and this is an example that I gave 
uh, after the elections in 2016. So the, the picture I was able to, um, to update to the current uh, political situation, but this example is well, I gave it a few days after Trump was elected during the SFN conference. So I can say he built a wall. They did not pay for it. A big surprise. And I can also say she built a wall. They did not vote for her. A big surprise. And by changing three out of 13 words here, I generated um, a big and important uh, difference in the narrative. And in this project, we asked how the brain translates small difference in the input into a big difference in the narrative. So in order to um, answer this question, I, was, I would first like to introduce to you the concept of processing time skills hierarchy. So in uh, Ul Hassan's lab, it was recently suggested that all cortical circuits can accumulate information over time and that the time scale of accumulation varies from, uh, short process, from regions that have short processing time scale, early sensory regions that accumulate information over tens to hundreds of milliseconds, which is equivalent to articulating a phoneme or a word, to regions that have medium processing time scales that accumulate information over a few seconds, which is equivalent to articulating a few words or a sentence, to regions that have long processing time scale, that accumulate information um, over many seconds to many minutes, that is equivalent to articulating uh, a few sentences or paragraph or the whole story. Now the processing time scale hierarchy predicts that the longer the processing time scale of a region, the larger the difference between these two narratives that I've just showed you. So for example, a voxel or a region that accumulates information over short processing time scales, so it will have a relatively small difference between these two narratives, okay? Because only three out of these three, 13 words are different. However, a voxel that accumulates information over a sentence will have a relatively larger difference in the response because two out of the three sentences are different. And regions that have long parsing time scale that accumulate information over the whole paragraph will have the largest difference in the neural response. So our hypothesis was that small changes in the response of short time scales region will be amplified as it progresses along the, pro the processing hierarchy. How did we test this? So participants were lying in the MRI scanner and they listened to one of two different stories. The two stories had exactly the same structure, only 33% of the words were changed. So the first story, the Milky Way story, started like this. The situation seemed almost hopeless. And after he spent most of the last weeks drinking, he knew he must confront the truth. The sec you, you can hear me, right? Like, the, you could hear the recording. Cool. Um, the second story, where again, you can see that we changed, only 33% of the words were changed, but the structure was exactly the same. So the second story, the vodka story, started like this. The situation seemed too good. And after she spent most of the last weeks worrying, she knew she could enjoy the moment. So this um, small changes in the word generated a uh, big difference in the narrative where the first story, the Milky Way story, was about Thomas that recently broke up with his girlfriend, Emily, but he's still obsessed with her. After meeting Epinatus, this uh, is replaced by a fixation on Milky Way and there is a happy ending. The second story, the vodka story, Rachel reaches the finals of American Idol and she's obsessed with the judge, Simon, and after meeting the psychic, this is replaced by a fixation on vodka and there's a sad ending, okay? So we generated Two different narratives and now what we wanted to test is the similarities and differences in the brain response between the two group of subjects that listen to one of the uh, two stories. Okay so first in order to measure the similarities between these two groups what we did is we use intersubject correlation. So I want to spend these uh, two or three slides in uh, explaining what is intersubject correlation. So this method was developed uh, by Uli Hassan, my postdoc advisor, do, while he did his, po his 
PhD in Rafi Malaf lab in the Weizmann Institute. And the idea is this. So in standard neuroimaging paradigms, what we usually do is we look at different conditions within an individual. So for example, when we wanna compare, uh, when we wanna study how the brain process faces, we will compare between uh, faces to houses, for example, and test which regions are uh, involved in processing the faces. In endocytic correlation, we reverse this, um, this um, notion and we ask how different individuals process the same stimulus, the same condition. So for example, um, we ask how the, um, what we do is we use each participant's brain response to, as, a, as a model to predict the brain response of the other participants. And what this allows us is not to have uh, the standard control condition, but it allows us to use uh, stimuli that are more uh, complex and rich, such as movies and stories. And the idea goes like this. So if, for example, this is the brain response of uh, one listener in the auditory cortex, and this is the brain response of a second listener in the auditory cortex. What we do is we look for voxels or regions that their brain response is correlated while participants are um, processing the same stimulus. And the idea is that there is no reason for the brain response to be correlated besides the external stimulus, okay? So you can look here. And this is a uh, slide I borrowed from, uh, from Hooli. Uh, so you can look here at the brain response of five participants during rest. Okay. And you can see that there's no correlation between uh, participants' brain response, which makes sense. Now look what happens when the story starts. So I'm banging out my story and I know it's good. And then I start to make it So you can see better. here. <laughs> You can see that um, you can see here that the brain response started to be correlated when the stimuli started, right? Because the auditory cortex responded in a similar way across different participants. Okay, so we use this method in order to um, estimate the similarities in the brain response between different participants listening to the same story, the vodka story or the Milky Way story. Now. What we use in order to test for differences in the brain response is a method we developed that um, is based on Euclidean distance between the average responses of the two groups. So how it goes, in every voxel or region, we extract the um, participants' time courses in this specific voxel. So this is the 18 time courses of the 18 participants listening to the Milky Way story, this is the time course in the auditory cortex, for example. We extract the 18 time courses of the participants that listen to the vodka story. Then what we do is we calculate the mean response of the Milky Way uh, participants, the mean response of the vodka participants, and then we just calculate the Euclidean distance between these two vectors, okay? Now, uh, this result, so we did this um, Euclidean distance calculation for each of this, the voxels that um, were involved in processing what the, one of the two different stories, okay, Milky Way or Vodka. So in each of these voxels that were involved in processing the story, we had also a distance measure that um, quantified the difference in the response for the Milky Way story and the vodka story. We then rank these uh, 7,000 uh, 7, voxels, we rank them according to the difference um, between the two stories, where you can see here, we, we divided them into five beans. The first bean had relatively small difference in the brain response, and the uh, last bean, the darker bean, had relatively large difference in the brain response. And now what we want to see is where are these beans located in the brain, okay? So this is what you see here. This is a map of the um, 
of the Euclidean distance, the difference between the Milky Way story and the vodka story, the response, the neural response to these two stories. And what you can see here in the lighter colors are regions that had relatively small difference and darker colors are regions that had relatively large difference. And you can see here that early auditory cortex had relatively small difference between the Milky Way and the Vatka story. However, higher order regions such as the TPJ or the Pucinius had relatively large difference between these two, two stories. And just to give you an estimation of what do I mean by small and large. So for example, um, the difference in the left TPJ was more than 10 times larger than the difference in the auditory cortex. Okay, so now we want to test our hypothesis that this um, amplification of difference is related to the voxels crossing time scale, um, if it's short, medium, or long. And in order to do that, we used an independent data that was collected by Yulia Lerner um, about eight years before our data. And using this data, we define regions uh, parsing time scale. Okay, and what you can see here, the lighter colors are um, short crossing time scale, and the darker colors are long crossing time scale. And let's look at our map, the map that we got from this data, from comparing the Milky Way and vodka uh, differences in the neural responses. And you can see with the naked eye that there's a striking similarity between this map that was calculating an independent data in order to calculate the processing uh, time scale of a region and this map that uh, shows you the brain different, the response difference between the two stories. And indeed, what we can see here is that what we got is that there's a strong positive correlation between the processing time scale index of a voxel and the distance between the two stories. So the longer the processing time scale of a voxel, the larger the difference between the two stories. Okay, so now we wanted to look deeper into this effect and we asked two different things. So first, we got the simplification of distance pattern when we compared the brain response across the whole story. But maybe it was seven minutes long story, maybe there is just one part of the story that generated the, this amplification of distance pattern. And we wanted to test if this is the case. So for that, the author of the story divided the story into uh, the 12 scenes. And what we did, we calculated for each of the scenes, we calculated the Euclidean distance between the Milky Way story and the Vodka story, and then ranked them uh, according to the difference, okay? So for example, for the first scene, what you see here, if it goes from lighter colors to darker colors, it means that it had the same amplification pattern as the whole story. And so you can see that this was the case for the first scene. This was also the case for the second scene. And in fact, this was the case for 11 out of the 12 scenes. And only in the last scene, there was a small difference in the response. But what we can say here is that the simplification of uh, distance between early sensory regions to higher order regions was true not only to one part of the of the story but in fact to the majority of the story. Okay so the second thing we wanted to ask is we got this amplification of distance pattern when we compared between the Milky Way story and the Vodka story and I remind you what we did here we did we um, changed the word almost hopeless to, uh, to too good, the word he, to she, the word he knew he must, the sentence he knew he must confront the truth, to she knew she could enjoy the moment. But what if this amplification of distance will happen in any change of words that we'll do? It, it's not related to the narrative, it's not related to the fact that we change the narrative, but any change that we'll make into the story will be amplified along the crossing time scale hierarchy. So to test this, we generated another condition, the Milky Way synonyms. So in this condition, instead of saying uh, the situation seemed almost hopeless, it was the situation was almost desperate. 
Instead of after he spent, it was after Martin spent. Instead of he knew he must confront the truth, he knew it was time to face reality. Okay, so we changed exactly the same amount of words, but this time we did not change the narrative. So the question is, is the amplification of difference dependent on forming two distinct narratives? And in short, the answer is yes. So I remind you, when we compared between two different narratives, between the Milky Way and the vodka, we saw the simplification of difference. However, when we compared between two similar narratives, between Milky Way and Milky, Milky Way synonyms, we did not see that. Also, when we compared between the Milky Way and the vodka story, we saw that there was this positive correlation such that the longer the passing time scale index of a region, the larger the difference between the two stories. When we compared between two similar narratives between the Milky Way and Milky Way synonyms, we did not see this um, correlation. And in fact, if anything, we saw a slightly negative correlation. And this slightly negative correlation was due to these voxels, which interestingly, these voxels are located in the primary auditory cortex. And when you think about it, it makes sense because for the auditory cortex, the difference between he and she is relatively small. However, the difference between he and Martin is relatively large. However, for higher order regions, so for example, for regions in the TPJ or the farther regions or in the Pocinius, the difference between he and she could be very big. It refers to two different people. However, for uh, the difference between he and Martin is relatively small because it refers to the exact same person. Okay? So to summarize this product, we asked how the brain translates small differences in the input into big differences in the narrative. And our answer is that local change in the input structure is amplified along the crossing time scale hierarchy to generate a big change in the meaning. Now, in this product, we used um, similar words, but we had a change in 33% of the words were different. In the second project I want to uh, discuss with you today, the stimuli was exactly the same. Okay, so uh, what we did there is we had uh, 40 participants lying in the MR scanner, and there were listening to 12 minutes of a story by J.D. Salinger, Pretty Mouse and Green My Eyes. This story is about a phone conversation between two good friends. And these two friends came back from a party. And uh, here, Arthur, uh, one of the friends, could not find his wife. And he's calling Lee to ask him if he know where his wife is. Now, the... Um, Salinger wrote it in a way that there is a woman next to, uh, next to Lee and her identity is not uh, explicitly known to the readers or to the listeners. And we uh, gave 20 of the participants one context, the cheating context, where we said that actually the woman next to Lee is Arthur's wife and that they have been having an affair over a year now. To the other 20 participants, we told before listening to the story, we told them in the paranoia context, we told them that actually Arthur is paranoid, is always wondering and thinking that his wife is cheating on him, and this is not the case. The woman next to Lee is actually his girlfriend and they're desperate to go to sleep. Okay, so this context um, had a large effect on the way that the participants interpret these 12 minutes uh, narrative. And to verify this, we had um, participants after the scan have a comprehension and interpretation questionnaire. I would like you now to choose one of these contexts and listen to a small part of the conversation just to feel how this context shape your interpretation. Did you happen to know did you happen to notice when Joni was leaving? Did you happen to notice if she left with the Ellenbogans by any chance? The gray-haired man looked left again, but high this time, away from the girl who was now watching him rather like a young, blue-eyed Irish policeman. 
No, I didn't, Arthur. Uh, didn't she leave with you? No, Christ! You didn't see her leave at all, then? W well, no. As a matter of fact, I, I didn't, Arthur. So, as I'm sure you felt, there's a big difference between uh, someone that listened to this part of the story if they were exposed to the cheating context versus if they were exposed to the paranoia context. So, for example, someone that was um, exposed to the cheating context will think that Lee is lying when he say that he didn't see Arthur's wife, whereas someone that was exposed to the paranoia context will think that he's telling the truth. So the mental states uh, we attribute to the characters are different. So let's see how our uh, participants comprehend and interpret this story. So we had 27 questions that were context independent. So for example, what was the girl doing when the phone rang? And you can see here that the, uh, both groups participants knew the right answer and here the y-axis is the correct response. And you can see that the cheating and the paranoia groups had relatively high uh, performance and comparable performance. However, this was not the case for the context dependent questions such as why do you think we didn't want Arthur to come over? So participants that listen to the story after being exposed to the cheating context will say because he didn't want him to find out that his wife is there and participants that listen to the story after being exposed to the paranoia context will say he was desperate to go to sleep. And indeed, this is what we got. Here the y-axis is cheating appropriate response and here the y-axis is paranoia appropriate responses. And you can see that there's a very different pattern of response depending on the context that participants were exposed to. So it's nice to see that the manipulation worked, but um, now what we want to see is context-dependent response in the brain. In order to test for voxels that had context-dependent response, we, used, we developed a Euclidean distance classifier. So in this classifier, in each voxel or a region, we use the 19 participants um, that listen to the story after being exposed to the cheating context, we use 19 participants' time courses as a training set, and we leave one out and use it as a testing set, okay? So there, was, there were overall 20 participants, 20 cheating uh, participants, 19 serves as training set, one as a testing set. We did exactly the same thing for the paranoia uh, group. And then what we do, we calculate the mean response of the cheating training set, the mean response of the paranoia training set, and then we calculated the Euclidean distance between the cheating testing set and the uh, cheating training set, and between the cheating testing set and the paranoia training set. And if the cheating Euclidean distance is smaller than the paranoia Euclidean distance, the classifier classifies it as belonging to the cheating group, and if otherwise, as belonging to the paranoia group. Okay, and we do the same thing uh, for the par paranoia testing set. And overall, we repeat this two leave out algorithm 400 times, each time taking two participants out of the 40 participants. And this um, result in one classification accuracy per voxel. I remind you that if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask uh, during the talk. Um, okay, so in order to test whether this classification accuracy is significant or not, what we did is we shuffled the labels. So we created two pseudo groups that had um, participants from the cheating context and from the paranoid context in each group, and we did exactly the same thing. So we classified this, uh, these pseudo groups and we repeated this 100,000 times, that resulted in a null distribution of the classification accuracy. And we just tested and calculated the p-value of the real data classification accuracy. Okay, so let's look at uh, the brain response that was context dependent based on our classifier. So this is what you see here. The regions, uh, this is a map of the voxels that had context-dependent response. And just to give you an estimation of the effect, 
So the uh, classification accuracy here started from 66% to 88% in classifying to which group these uh, participants belong. And I remind you, this was exactly the same 12-minute story, okay? And what we can see here, uh, I want to highlight a couple of things. One is that you see that the primary auditory cortex did not differentiate between the two contexts. The second thing I want to highlight here is that the majority of the um, mentalizing network you can call it default mode network, you can call it social and cognition network, because there's a lot of overlap between all these three definitions. Uh, so you can see that uh, the pecunious TPJ, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex that is involved in narrative comprehension, all these regions have context-dependent response. Okay, the response was different depending on the context. We can also see that regions outside these uh, uh, classic mentalizing um, network, such as part of the part of the mirror neuron system and the bilateral hippocampus, they also had context-dependent response. Now, so it's nice to see that um, a lot of um, um, brain regions had context-dependent response, but now our question was whether these regions were actually sensitive to differences in interpretation, okay? So it's not just the context across the whole story, but it's uh, the effect of the context was different, was modulated uh, in different parts of the story. So in order to test this, what we did, we had five independent raters Great, the difference in mental states of the characters. So it's a, what I call a second order theory of mind test. What they need to do is they need to think of someone that is listening to the story after being exposed to the cheating context, someone that is listening to the story after being exposed to the paranoia context, and then think what would be the difference. So we divided, sorry, we divided the story into 171 um, intervals. And then in each interval, the, these five raters had to rate what will be the difference between these two listeners. And what you see here, the y-axis is interpretation difference and the x-axis is time. And you can see that there was a large variability uh, in the interpretation difference. It's not just that the context changed the whole story, uh, interpretation, but there were parts that it changed more and parts that it changed less. And for example, uh, in this time interval, where you see that the independent raters thought that there would be a large difference in the uh, interpretation between the two groups. So Arthur is telling Lee that Joni just came home. So I'll just remind you that Someone that is in the cheating context will say, okay, Arthur is sa saying that to save his face, we know that Joni is actually with Lee. And someone from the paranoia context will say, okay, that's good, everybody can go back to sleep and everything got back into place. Okay, so what you see here is a vector of the interpretation difference, and we can actually do exactly the same thing for the neural difference. So we can divide the um, time course into 171 segments, the same 171 segment, and calculate the Euclidean distance in these segments. And what you see here, so the, I don't know what to call it the y-axis, but kind of the y-axis are voxels that had context-dependent response, what you saw before. The x-axis is time, and the darkness of the, of the dot means how, um, Big is the Euclidean distance between the mean neural responses. So again, here you can see uh, the darker colors that match this event. Now what we are going to see is we just correlated between these two vectors, okay? Between the interpretation difference vector and the Euclidean distance um, of the brain response. And this is what you see here. So in white and blue are the voxels that I showed you before that have context-dependent response. 
in blue are voxels that had significant correlation between difference in the neural response and difference in interpretation. So what it means is the larger the difference in the interpretation, the larger the difference in the neural response between the two groups. Okay, so to summarize this project, what we saw is that although the external input was exactly the same, the same 12 minutes story, there was a difference in the neural response, mostly in the mentalizing uh, a narrative comprehension network, depending on participants' interpretation. Now, can I ask well, a question, Yara? Sure. Just on this part. So I was wondering if there's also, maybe you check this, maybe you can look at a baseline period. If there is a part of the brain that shows the prior belief itself in the absence of further stimulation. Okay, so before you hear the story, you get this belief that you're, you're given this information. I wonder if you can see a difference just related to that before you get more information pertaining to it. Um, that's a great question that um, after doing all this work, we thought how we did not scan participants while they had these four lines of text and we did not scan them. So we don't know the answer to this, but I can tell you it's um, maybe relates to your question. So um, Ken Norman in Princeton University, um, so he and uh, his uh, PhD student and Mainen, what they're doing is they took this data and now they're trying to uh, using real real time fMRI to manipulate participants into thinking one of these two contexts, which is crazy, but it didn't work. <laughs> but um, but it is a really really cool idea, and they did scan participants. Um, well, they did not scan participants during the 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 four lines because they did not give them four lines, but they they are trying to have something, I think, like what you mean, just these prior beliefs, how does it look like? Um, yeah. Okay, so what we see here is that, you know, only four lines of context that we gave participants before they started listening to the, to the story were enough to generate this in-group clustering and out-group differentiation of the neural responses. And you can imagine that in real life when, I, I don't think there is time that we saw it more than these days that we live in, that when people constantly accumulate information through different sources, so it could be news channels or newspapers with opposing political views, um, I see that there's something in the chat. Um, so, um, you can imagine that these differences might be even bigger. Okay, so uh, I would like to move on to the uh, third project in order for you to stop imagining and let's see how it looks in real life. Um, before that, I'll just read. Okay, uh, I see here a question uh, of Lior. Uh, what about letting people listening, listen to the story and then ask them what they think and then do reverse en engineering to their neural responses. That's a great suggestion that I often get, but the thing is that Salinger wrote the story. It's kind of an ambiguous way, but if you'll read it and if you'll read, so what I did, I also read, uh, you know, um, people from comparative literature um, that wrote that he wrote it in a way that more, more people will think about the cheating interpretation than the paranoia interpretation. And we did not have the, the time and money to, to wait till enough people will have the paranoia. Um, but I think that's a really uh, good suggestion, which in a way I'm going to answer right now in the, in the third project, where we, you don't uh, tell people what to think, okay? Um, so this is the third project. Um, okay, so three months after I started my position in Tel Aviv University, elections were declared in Israel. I then thought it's a unique opportunity 
to test for differences, um, how, to see how people's natural tendencies to interpret the world through their own subjective filter shape in real time. Um, so the idea was to uh, scan participants, left-wing and right-wing participants, before the elections and after the elections. And the idea was that we'll have a measure of both between um, individuals, um, differences in the brain response, and also within individual differences in the brain response on different time points. Uh, then I thought two different time points. And then it was supposed, um, because things change, right? The, the elections, we assume that the elections will change how people will feel to events that happen uh, before the elections. Okay. And um, this is, uh, Due to life uh, and other things, it's an ongoing experiment. Um, so, okay, so what we did, 40 participants, 20 left wing and 20 right wing, were lying in the MRI scanner and they watched eight different movie clips. So most of the movie clips were campaign ad, left wing or right wing uh, political campaign ads. You can enjoy them uh, while I'm talking. Um, or not? No? Okay. Um, anyway, so they watch these um, political campaign ads or political speeches and in the MRI scanner, after each movie clip, the movie clip range between uh, a minute and 20 seconds to six minutes long, but that was the longest um, movie clip. And after each of these movie clips, Inside the scanner, they had to answer, on a visual analog scale, they had to answer three different questions. How much did you agree with the main message of the clip? How much did this clip interest you? And how emotionally engaged did you feel? And they rated it with an uh, MRI compatible mass between not at all to very. So this they did eight times, each time after each of the eight movie clips. And then outside the scanner, they also had detailed interpretation questionnaire on each movie. Okay, so this was done three weeks before the April 2019 elections. And then we um, waited for the elections to take place. And then we waited for the coalition to be formed. Um, it didn't happen. So what we did is um, we decided to scan them again during three weeks in July. So these same participants, as you can see, only 24 out of the 40 participants agreed to come back. And they watched the same eight movie clips again. And then we thought, fortunately enough, in the uh, uh, IRB, in the Helsinki, I had, um, it just changed just before the experiment started, like uh, when we, um, wrote the RB actually from two to three times that participants <laughs> can come. There are some people that blame me for that. And, um, and then we waited for the elections in September to take place. We waited to the coalition to be formed. It didn't happen. We waited to um, the March elections to take place. We waited to the, for the coalition to, to be formed. It did happen, but due to COVID-19, and due to um, the not very stable situation, because we need three weeks that everything will be stable, that we can scan them again. Uh, so I'm not sure when we'll scan them again, but hopefully uh, in the near future. And um, this paradigm allowed us to ask two, at least two different questions. One is test for differences in the brain response that stems from participants' political views, okay? Just comparing between left-wing and right-wing uh, opinions. The second is to test for the dynamics of the brain response over time while there are shifts in participants' knowledge and emotional responses following the elections. And again, I did not know how many shifts there are going to be. Um, okay, so I remind you, the results here are very, very preliminary, but I will share them with you. So um, first for the behavioral results in the MRI scanner. So 
this will be the results for the uh, campaign out of the Likud. And what you see here, the in red are left-wing participants, in blue are right-wing participants. And you can see that there was a large difference in how much these participants agreed with the main message. This is not surprising, but uh, this is what we found. What was nice is that all participants were very much interested by this movie clip and emotionally engaged with it, okay? So even participants that did not agree with the main message, they were still engaged and interested by the movie clip. We can see the same but opposite pattern for the left-wing campaign ad, where you can see that um, left-wing participants agreed with the main message much more than right-wing participants. And again, everyone were engaged by this clip. And if we can, uh, we can look at the behavioral results, the detailed behavioral results for the um, Likud campaign ad, the right-wing campaign ad. And we had, again, we had five filter independent questions such as, is it argued in the video that unemployment is at an all-time low? Which is going to be funny to scan them again uh, after Corona. Um, and then, we had, so this is the average response for the five filter independent questions. And you can see here that the left wing and right wing participants were, had comparable responses and relatively high um, correct values. However, for the eight filter dependent questions, such as to what extent do you believe that the legal proceedings will prove that Benjamin Netanyahu is innocent between not at all and very, there was a very big difference between them. And this is the average for eight filter dependent questions. And you can see that there was a, a large difference in the interpretation of these uh, kind of questions. Okay, so now let's look at the brain response. And uh, again, I feel um, we still need um, statistics for that. So take it with a grain of salt. So what you see here, this is for the uh, Likud campaign ad. This is the interstellar correlation value, the similarity value um, for the left wing participants while watching the uh, Likud um, campaign ad. This is for the right wing participants. And you can see that overall there were a lot of similarities, but we were interested in the differences. So to test for differences, we use two methods. The first method is just comparing the R value, the intersubject correlation value between these two groups. Okay, just having a t-test and comparing that. And this is what you see here. So in blue, you see regions that were more synchronized and were more involved in processing the stimulus in the right-wing participants than in the left-wing participants and in red, the other way around. And it is very clear, and this is something that I, you, I'm um, uh, confident about now that we have also statistics, that the right-wing participants were much more synchronized than the left-wing participants. And this was true both for the uh, Likud campaign ad and also for the Meretz campaign ad. Okay, so it was not about the content, but they were just more synchronized. And I can also tell you, we have a neutral movie where it didn't happen. Okay, so it's not that um, the right-wing participants were more synchronized for any movie, but it was dependent on the political content. The second thing we did is exactly like in the Salinger story, we had um, a classifier, a Euclidean distance classifier. And I wanna say that these results might not stay after correction for um, multiple comparisons. But what we see here is that we can see that the precarious and surprisingly, the auditory cortex had different response depending on uh, participants' political opinions. And this was for the Likud campaign ad. And we also saw this for the um, Menetz campaign ad. Okay, these are two different maps. And so um, to summarize 
all these three projects and the talk, we asked on which level do subjective filters operate? And our answer till now is when we externally manipulated participants, like in the uh, Salinger story, to interpret the story in one way or the other, we saw differences in higher order regions. However, when we used much more basic filters, filters that uh, participants came from home with, like political opinions, we saw these differences even in early sensor regions. And this is the take home message. And I would like to um, thank Poli Hassan uh, for being an amazing um, supervisor and collaborator and all my lab and especially the people that were involved in this very challenging project and especially Noah that is bravely leading this um, complex um, elections project. And thank you. Thank you, Yara, for a very exciting and stimulating talk. Uh, whether you're right wing or left wing, I think this is a very interesting <laughs> kind of thing to see. And uh, yeah, uh, we're happy to take questions. I have a question. Yes. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to consider uh, the fact that language is embodied so that networks associated with leg related words are different than uh, hand related words or face related words and how that might affect your results, if at all. That's a very interesting question. Um, specifically, I'm very intrigued. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll share screen again just to show you the region, um, which is very related to your question. Uh, just a second. Okay, so we saw this very strange somatosensory, um, right? I, you can, I don't know, it's, it's I, I'm not sure what's, what to make out of it. And when I gave this talk, I can stop here. Uh, when I gave this talk in um, Moscow, it's funny, I was in London last week in Moscow, and it's very, easy with Zoom. So somebody suggested that maybe it has to do with embodiment. And this is the difference between the, let, for example, in this, um, in this project, this will be the difference between the left wing and the right wing participants that they process the information differently and they, um, they use these different representation of the same content. So I was wondering, do you have any suggestion? Like, this is what reminded you of the question or it was something else? Uh, no, that's exactly what my question was. And uh, one of the things that you might really want to do, uh, uh, it's going to ratchet up your uh, need for engineering talent, but um, the whole issue of uh, functional connectivities, that is um, how you look at long range versus short range connections, how that might be, um, consequence of things like age and gender and matters like that. But there is a technology available for really taking a look at these um, small versus large world networks. And I would suggest that you do that, especially considering that you've got a, con a potential confounding variable in all of this stuff. A potential what? Confounding variable, which is the issue of embodiment. Because the issue of embodiment is actually, it had been thought that, for example, that Broca's area and Wernicke's area were respectively involved in expressive and receptive language. In fact, it doesn't work that way. In fact, the networks are very different depending upon what parts of speech you use, what words you use, um, what your gender is. So um, I'm, I'm not playing the research methodology game. I'm just saying that there's something in this that really bears looking at. And you may actually find that your results are a whole lot stronger as a result of looking at those variables. But it's fascinating work and, I, and, and thank you. Thank you. And I, I think I will use your suggestion and I think of it as the richness of the filters through which we see the world. So you're right. I mean, the gender and the age and everything 
including the political opinions, are part of how we perceive the world and how it's uh, reflected in our brain response. And I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. Arif, uh, me here with the philosophy of uh, Georgi Ivanovich Gurshev, you told that uh, we need to make speech grows and uh, after this we can uh, understand the outer world. So how did this uh, has to come with uh, the subject of your talk? Um, I'm sorry, yeah. I wasn't able to hear. Can you maybe type your question in the chat? Okay. Thank you. It was a bit uh, unclear. In the meantime, do you have another question? Yes, I want to ask a question. Uh, so first of all, thank you. It was uh, a real fascinating talk. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, uh, it's related to the first project, maybe also to the second. Um, what would be the difference as if we told someone a story about, let's say, Martin, and then told him the same story about himself. Hmm. Um, that's a nice question. So I know of, uh, uh, there's work which is not exactly the same, because you mean the perspective will be of a different person or of your... Uh, no, I mean, it, it's, it's not so much the, the perspective, but I want it. I want it to be related to myself. It, it's not a matter of um, um, perspective taking. Okay. I mean, it. Okay, it doesn't have to be about myself. It could be about my brother, but someone who is related, something that is related to me. Okay. So, what do you think will be the difference? I mean, if I would have to um, guess, I will say that it will be mainly in the regions we saw in the Salinger story, where you have the, the, you know, the social cognition regions, that it really matters. You know, the difference between he and she is relatively, it could be relatively large, it could be relatively small, it depends on, on, the, on the other context of the narrative, but um, I agree that the difference between he and Martin, or he and me, is even larger. So it could be interesting to test this, and I guess it will be in the um, higher order regions. There will be the difference, the larger difference, the largest. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. And I see that Ilya typed his question, so. Uh, so first, thank you. I'm not familiar with uh, his philosophy. And I'm not sure how to, um, how to co combine it with my results. Do you have any, any suggestion? Ilya? Okay, in the meantime, Yara, can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, just uh, so m many of these, uh, the difference regions, okay, uh, are located in regions of well, the default mode. These are kind of, uh, they used to be famous as kind of task uh, relevant regions. They're not actually activated by the task. And I'm wondering, there, there could be kind of a potential compound in that, that these regions have larger kind of resting state fluctuations, which are unrelated to what's going on. Maybe they have short moments in which they synchronize, but most of the time it's kind of what, like what you showed at the beginning. They don't care about the task, so they're very different, because just because they're different, right? So it's true that you dealt with this a little bit by using the, uh, the one which had the adjectives, which had kind of a similar meaning, okay? So this partially addresses it. But this, again, could find some different level of structure, which is not necessarily semantic, right? 
Okay, so that's an interesting question. So A, we're now writing a review about the default mode network not being uh, task negative, but um, I think what can, a finding that can, uh, uh, besides the comparison between the Milky Way and Milky Way synonyms, a finding that could be um, more convincing is that we found, or more specifically, Eva Sivani uh, working uh, during his postdoc in Uri Hassan's lab found that when you compare resting state between different individuals, so you can take people and just let them you know, lie in the scanner, and instead of looking at functional connectivity within a brain, look um, on what is called inter uh, subject functional connectivity, I sub C, and compare the brain response between brains. And there, what you see is that all of a sudden during rest, there's nothing. There's no correlation between different participants. It's, it's only when the narrative starts. And even more so, when the narrative does not make any sense, when you, know, you scramble the words, you, again, you see only uh, intersubject correlation in the auditory cortex, but not in higher order regions. You need the narrative in order to generate the response in the, in the higher order regions, in the default mode network. Cool. Yeah. Good. Sure. Fantastic. Okay. Um, any other questions? Last question for Yara? Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I was wondering if you uh, present a stimuli that would be only visual, do you think you find in different places in the brain? If I, uh, well, it depends what is the visual stimuli. So if it's, uh, you know, Charlie Chaplin visual stimuli, yeah. yeah. No, I so mean, if let me be more precise with my question. Okay. Do you think uh, those higher brain function, they are related to the modality or they are our modality? Okay, they are our modality. And I, the reason I say quite um, certain is that Uri Hassan have a lot of papers that show that it doesn't matter how you tell the story. So for example, there's Hyder and Simo, uh, you know, shapes that um, try to catch each other. And so he tested this using uh, an animation, a shape animation or a verbal story without any visual input. And he saw that the um, higher order regions, this region that we mentioned, the Pecunia, PGA, frontal region had exactly or similar response, no matter how the, uh, the modality that the input was. And also, for example, um, uh, if you tell the same story in English or in Russian. Okay, so the auditory cortex have the uh, very different response because the, you know, the um, features of the signal are different. However, regions in the uh, frontal regions and all the DMN that we mentioned, these regions have similar response because the content, the narrative is the same. So I can say quite confidently that the, these regions are a modality. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Um, let's thank Yara again for an excellent talk. Uh, I feel you're very lucky to do something so cool. And I wish you and everyone a few weeks at least of stability. <laughs> So you can get your study done and we can get our life back on. <laughs> I think everybody will be very happy. Great. Thank you, Roy, and thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming. You. See you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.